Hey folks, time for another sonnet by Edmund Spencer. Uh, last time we read his sonnet number 30, which is a fire and ice paradox sonnet. Uh, now we're going to read his sonnet 75 from the same sequence. Uh, as I told you, uh, you know, like we're going to, one of the good things about sonnets and the fact that they're numbered like this is, uh, as opposed to having regular titles, is that you can watch the progression of the poet, uh, the way they use ideas, the way they use symbols, the way they're, they're, I guess aptitude for poetry progresses as time goes on. And I think you're going to see uh, a much more complex, a much more robust uh, sonnet. I mean, I, I thought the first one was pretty good, but uh, I love this poem. This is this is one of my like top 10 uh, all time. So let's, um, and, and I guess there's a couple of sonnets from this unit that fall into my top 10 all time. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's quick review uh, a sonnet. Remember, and, and you're going to get sick of me reviewing this, but you're going to know it by the end. And that's the key. It's a 14-line poem, not 13, not 15, always 14. Written in iambic pentameter, that means the syllables are 10. Every, every line has 10 syllables all the way down. Um, with an intricate rhyme scheme, we talked about rhyme schemes last time. Uh, it's The 14 lines are going to be made up of poetic units. It's important to be able to identify the poetic units so that you can identify the meaning. Sometimes it's three quatrains and a couplet. Sometimes it's an octave and a sestet. Sometimes it's an octave and a quatrain and a couplet. Uh, you just have to be able to identify the rhymes and figure out how they rhyme because each unit of rhyme is going to be a separate, almost like a paragraph in a essay. If, if the whole thing is metaphorically an essay, then each rhyming element is a new paragraph, uh, and each one is going to make a different point. Um, and it's usually about love, in this case, unrequited love, when you love someone who doesn't love you back. I don't need to go over the rest of this stuff. We've been over it. We're going to look at it again in this poem. We'll look at the meter. We'll look at the rhyme. Um, we'll look at the rhyme scheme. We'll, we'll identify that it's a Spencerian sonnet, because it is. Um, you know, and all those kinds of things. We'll look at sound devices. We'll go through those things. We'll look at figurative language. And of course, we'll look at symbolism. Um, the only thing you need to know about Sonnet 75 that I really haven't gone over yet is that this poem is an example of a poem that includes dialogue. You'll see going down here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 lines that we've got a quotation mark right here, said she. We got her actually talking to him. Hey, he's progressed. Last time he just loved this girl and there was no conversation going on, but now they're they're talking. Um, so she's going to talk to him. We got an end quotation here. And then we have a new quotation, quote I, which means he responds. So we have a dialogue. We have um, two people talking. And that's sort of interesting and different in this poem compared to the last one. So uh, let's start out making sure this is a sonnet. Like I said, it's 14 lines. Let's take a quick look at the rhyme scheme because that's always worth doing. Remember, your first is always an A. Uh, strand is A. Away is B. Hand goes back to strand, A. Pray is away. That's B. A say, obviously a B. Immortalize. That's new. That's a C. Decay uh, goes with pray. Uh, likewise, that's going with immortalize. That's a C. Devise, that's a C. Fame, that's brand new, it's a D. Eternize goes with devise, that's a C. Name is going to go with fame, and then subdue and renew our new one. So you can identify that it's a Spencerian sonnet. We've got, whoopsie, we've got um, three quatrains, and I'm just going to artificially separate it here, uh, and a couplet. Uh, so we'll be able to look at those as as unique elements of meaning. Um, next thing we want to do is we just want to read it quickly through so that we understand basically what it's about. I don't have to read this one and then accent. The rhyme is such that it, it stood the test of time. Um, one day I wrote her name upon the strand, but came the waves and washed it away. Again, I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. Vain man, said she, that does in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize, for I myself shall like to this decay, and eke my name be wiped out likewise. Not so, quote I, let baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. My verse, your virtues rare shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name, where, when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live and later life renew. One thing you may want to do, especially if you're reading sonnets uh, and, and you haven't 
seen a word before and you don't know what it means is, is take the time to highlight words that you may not recognize uh, and, and make sure that you understand what those words mean. So one day I wrote her name upon the strand. You're like strand, like, like stranded. I think clearly with the next line, but came the waves and washed it away. It's the sand. Um, you know, like they're, they're walking on the beach here and waves are coming and washing away the name that he wrote in the sand. Uh, so you can figure that one out from context. Um, but then we've got vain in here twice, uh, and he's using both meanings of vain. Uh, so if you don't know what vain is, look it up. It's got two meanings. One meaning of vain is vanity, um, when you're, uh, full of yourself and conceited. Um, and the other is when you do something in vain, like you studied hard for a test, but it was all in vain because you still failed. Um, it's, it's doing something that has no effect. Um, and then, uh, Immortalize goes back to mortal to make something immortal. I think that's pretty clear. It's the verb of, of making something immortal. Um, eek is weird. Uh, that's one you probably don't know. You got to go back to Renaissance times um, and look that word up. But eek um, in this sentence could be replaced with then, and then my name be wiped out likewise. Um, quote is a, is a way of saying quoted um, in an old way, so you can get that. Uh, baser. Uh, is usually a term referred to as metals, like um, lead would be a base metal and gold would be a pure metal. And so there's this, this distinction between high and low going on there that you could look up. Um, base is, is the lowest of the low. Um, let's see, uh, virtues, this is an old spelling of virtues, so we'll just change it. Um, my verse, your virtues rare. So when somebody's got virtues, it's the opposite of um, negative attributes. It's their positive attributes. Um, there were the seven deadly sins and the seven um, holy virtues, right? And so uh, virtues are the opposite of, of sins or negative things. Uh, eternize is kind of like immortalize. It is the, um, the verb of making eternal, to make something eternal. I think we skipped a say. Did I skip a say? A say is attempt. I should have, I should have hit that one too. Um, a say to make an essay is to make an attempt. It's an old word, but you can look up all the words that you don't know, uh, and that will help you understand the poem too. It's really important that you understand the language that's being used so that you can figure out what the poem's all about and what it means. All right, so let's um, then do what we usually do and go through this stanza by stanza and try and make sense of it. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. We, we decided that, that was the beach. Um, but came the waves and washed it away. Again, I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. So, you know, here's Spencer and uh, the woman he's in love with, uh, and uh, they are walking on the beach. So, hey, he's, he's made success. Last time she wouldn't do anything with him. Now they're, they're visiting the beach together. Very, very typical thing that couples do. Um, and in the action of the poem, he stops and he writes their name in the sand. So, I don't know. We've seen this on the beach. I don't know how many times, right? Where it's a big heart. And inside the heart, it's like Spencer plus, um, I'm trying to remember what her name is. Uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. I can't remember, um, but there's no there's no picture of her that exists in real life. Uh, so uh, I think it starts with a B. Anyway, he writes he writes Spencer and Elizabeth, you know, in or Edmund and Elizabeth in a heart there on the beach. And uh, but what happens when you go back to the poem is the the waves came and washed it away. So the water comes up and takes away the name. So it's wiped out. And so he gets angry. He's like, uh, and he writes it again maybe in all caps with an exclamation point, uh, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. So the effort that he took to write the name was, was washed away by the ocean again. I think this is an interesting word. Um, I'm going to use italics for um, figurative language. Uh, what we've got here is personification, right? So the tide comes in and, and the ocean is predatory. The ocean is taking away this thing that, and same thing with wash, the waves washed it away. Like washing is a cleaning, um, something that humans do. Uh, and so on some level, the ocean is cleaning the beach, but the ocean is also preying on his efforts and, and destroying it. So, um, you know, that's our first scene. And then we move on to a second scene. We've got a little, little, um, symbolism going on, but we don't understand it yet. So I'm not going to hit the symbolism until just a minute. Um, 
now we start the dialogue. Uh, and if you go over here, I think I wrote down um, dialogue as a term. Yep, there it is. So you can you can look at it down at the bottom of the screen. Die is two and log is speech. So dialogue is when two or more people are having a conversation in a written work. In this case, um, you know, she's beginning a dialogue. She's beginning a conversation with him. And so she says, vain man, said she, that does in vain attempt, and I'm, I'm using modern language, a mortal thing so to immortalize, for I myself shall like to this decay, and then my name be wiped out likewise. I love this. Uh, Spencer is, is playing with tropes here. Uh, traditionally in sort of the sexist society uh, that people lived in, especially in the Renaissance, women were seen as overly emotional. Uh, and what's interesting is the, in this in this relationship, Spencer's the one who's emotional and she's the one who's sort of, I don't know, heartless. And, and you could see this in what she says. She's like, you idiot. You know, you're trying to tell me that our love is immortal by writing our name in the sand on the beach. That's stupid. Uh, it's the most temporary thing you could possibly do. What you write on the beach never lasts. And so how is it like, we're going to last forever, just like this name on the beach, you idiot, right? Like, so she's calling him out. You're trying to, you're trying to make a mortal thing immortal. But on another level too, she's saying that, that love is a mortal thing. Love dies. Love doesn't last forever. We're always told, oh, well, love is going to last forever. Like I'm walking down the hallway at school and there's some guy leaning against the locker next to a girl and he's like, I love you forever, baby. And I want to stop him and be like, yo, buddy, you're in high school. How long do you think this relationship is really going to last? Uh, no offense. But, you know, this is this is funny to me because, you know, that's what she's saying. She's saying love is, is going to die. Uh, on a very pragmatic level, you know, most love relationships don't last. But also, let's say congratulations, you have a love that stands the test of time. Well, eventually one of you is going to die. Does the love die then? Okay, maybe it doesn't. Maybe one of you carries on the love for the rest of your life, but then both of you are going to die. Does the love last then? Well, okay, maybe if people remember you and the love you had for each other on some level, your love can last. But what happens when everybody you've ever known dies? It's like your love never existed, right? So she's calling him out. Like, this is a mortal thing. Nothing's immortal. Nothing human is immortal. And so to... to um underscore this fact, she makes a simile. She says, for I myself shall like to this decay, and then my name be wiped out likewise. And she engages the first symbol of the story. Uh, in fact, you can sort of get all the symbolism from this. So she says, you know, I'm like this name in the sand. And uh, my name is going to be wiped out just like the name in the sand was wiped out by by the waves. Uh, we're all metaphorically names in the sand. And, and once you start looking at this image and understanding what she's saying, this is rather profound. She suggests, um, and, and these are traditional images that you can associate with things. Sand is often associated with time. You ever heard the phrase, the sands of time? Right, so if the sand sort of represents time, because it's what we fill an hourglass with, and that's how they measured time uh, back in the Renaissance. Clocks were a brand new thing, and they weren't they weren't used very often. Um, so sand is is what is filling an hourglass. Sand slipping through your fingers, the hours, the minutes, the grains disappearing. That kind of an idea. Uh, so if sand is time, and our name in the sand represents a human life, we're all here very temporarily compared to how long time is. You know, we're, we're here for a second, um, you know, and the ocean is often used to represent eternity for a number of reasons. Uh, the ocean is unfathomably deep. It's unfathomably large. It, it surrounds everything. Uh, and it's been there forever. You know, dinosaurs swam in that ocean. The ocean is there unchanged since the time of the dinosaurs. It's been washing on the shore all of those years. And, and you go to the ocean and you look out on it. What percentage of, of, of geologic time are you in existence here in this world, right? And so her metaphor, her, her simile is that we're all just names in the sand. We're here briefly and then whoosh, in comes the ocean and washes us away. And then that, that metaphor of the ocean preying on them becomes a little bit more, 
I don't know, disturbing. This idea that that time is and, and eternity is just waiting to wash us away, and there's nothing we can do in our lives to make ourselves eternal. It's all just temporary. Love is an eternal. Life is an eternal. Nothing lasts, right? And so it's a very pragmatic, a very very dark sort of interpretation that she offers him. Um, and she says he's an idiot for trying to make things last forever, for trying to last beyond his lifetime. And that's sort of her, her angle. So to paraphrase her, if I roll down, um, remember what she said. Let's go back to the sonnet for just a second. What she said is vain man that does in vain attempt a mortal thing so to immortalize, for I myself shall like to this decay and then my name be wiped out likewise. So what she's saying essentially is, you idiot, you're trying to prove eternal love in a temporary way. We're like the name in the sand. We wash away. We all die. And so love does too, right? So she, she calls him out. How is Spencer going to respond to this? If you remember the last sonnet, Spencer's always the optimist, right? Like he, she rejects him. I don't know how many times and he's still like, I'm going to keep trying. Uh, and that's definitely the case here too. His optimism shows through. His response is not so, quote I, um, that means I said, let baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. My verse, your virtues rare shall eternize and in the heavens write your glorious name. So um, let's let's translate this. He's like, nah, -uh. I'm not going to die and disappear and neither are you. He says, let baser things. Remember, baser is a, a term that refers to metals. Base metals are like lead. They're like those unvaluable metals, but valuable metals like gold. So he's saying our relationship is like gold, you know, compared to all the other relationships of the world. We're, we're gold or silver or something, something pure. Um, and he says, let baser things devise to die in dust. This, by the way, is what we would consider to be an illusion a reference to an earlier work. Um, it references the Bible. There's a famous passage in the Bible when somebody dies. Um, they read it at funerals a lot. Dust to dust uh, ash, and ashes to ashes. Um, this idea that, um, you know, we're all born out of the earth and we all die and return to it. Uh, we're, we're back to dust. Uh, so to die in dust is a good way for him to say, you know, like we're not going to, that's not going to happen to us. Everything else is born out of the dust. Now, the dust, of course, connects back to the sand. So the whole poem has this continuity. Um, we're not going to turn back into sand. We're not going to be that name that washes away. Why? He says, you shall live by fame. My verse, verse is a fancy word for poetry. Uh, my verse, your virtues rare shall eternize. So he's like, yeah, no, we're not going to die because we're going to live on and we're going to be famous in poetry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write your name in a poem. Not on the beach, not on the sand, in a poem, right? And in the heavens, write your glorious name. And that will make you eternal. It's going to eternize you. And so his response really interestingly, and I'm going to paraphrase him down here too, is um, nah, -uh, let worthless things and worthless people and worthless relationships die. But you'll live forever because I'll write your name in a poem. Okay. So far, so good. He's, he's given his response. Uh, but we still have the couplet at the end. And remember, the couplet is the resolution of a poem like this. And how does Spencer resolve this thing? Um, I think it's really interesting. He says, where when as death shall all the world subdue, our lo love shall live and later life renew. Okay, so I like this death. This is a personification as well um, and maybe a symbol. We're talking about the Grim Reaper here. Death is going to come through and kill everybody, uh, everybody who's alive now and everybody they know. And in two generations, nobody's going to know Spencer and um, the woman that he's with, Elizabeth. And, and they're going to be, um, they're going to be gone, right? But he's like, no, no, when death will, all the worlds will do, everybody living now, when they're all dead, we're going to live on and our love is going to live on. And it's going to renew later life. So, uh, you know, in a paraphrase of that, um, even though everyone we know dies, our love will live on and this moment will be eternal in my poetry. Uh, right. The idea that that somehow poetry makes things eternal. And then this brings us down sort of to our theme or our lesson. Um, you know, this is an unrequited love poem, just like every sonnet ever. She is rejecting him and calling him stupid. Uh, and he is still 
hopelessly optimistic about things, but he's not even just optimistic about their chances of having a love relationship. He's also optimistic about his chances of being immortal after his death. Um, this poem is about two people on a beach, but it's also about the human condition. Uh, we're all names in the sand. We all vanish. We all cease to exist. And when we cease to exist, we're only remembered for a short temporary time. Even if somebody makes something somewhat permanent, a, a funeral stone for you with your name and the dates of your life on it, you walk through a cemetery, try it. Look at these headstones. What do you know about these people? You don't know much. You know, the years of their life and maybe a, a scrap of Bible verses thrown on there. That's it. Uh, we don't know who they loved. We don't know what they believed in. We don't know what they did, what their accomplishments were, what they were proud of. All these people live and die and they cease to be in any meaningful way. They vanish, as, as the wanderer said, into the night of the past as if they never were. And, and this is some powerful stuff. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, we know that, that the Egyptians, right, lived because they left pyramids for us. We know who the Pharaoh is, who's written in the hieroglyphs in the pyramid. But do we know anything about the people who built the pyramid? What their relationships were like, who they loved, what they believed in? They're gone. We know they exist because there's physical evidence of their existence. But imagine all those generations of people who never built anything, who were nomads wandering the world. And they're effectively vanished. And Spencer is addressing this basic human fear, right? Um, and he says that we can become immortal. We have to take ourselves out of this temporal cycle of tides where the eternity comes and washes us away. And the only way to do that is to make yourself immortal by writing something worth reading. Right. And so he says we become immortal because even though you die and I die, which has happened, by the way, and I guess Spencer has the last laugh here because we're still reading his poem. We're still considering his life. We're still seeing their love. It is eternal on some level because we just opened up the book and looked at the poem and saw them on the beach in this moment of time, which has been captured in, in eternity. And so writing is, is a form of time travel on some level. I'm always reminded of this Ben Franklin quote that I've written down here. Uh, again, the theme is, is writing is immortality. If you want to live beyond your years, write, write something or, or be written down. And Ben Franklin said it best. Um, my American founding father, there's a reason he's on the $100 bill, right? Like he said uh, very famously, if you would not be forgotten, when you're dead and rotten. Either do things worth the writing or write things worth the reading. And he's right. Spencer here is saying, if you want to live forever, you've got to be written down. And, and you've got to be written down in a way that matters. And Franklin paraphrases that, right? Like, you've either got to do something that's worth recording so that somebody will record your name in history, or you got to write something that's worth reading so people will read it and remember it. And that's what Spencer's done here. Um, now, I think there are some ironies that we can address in the poem too, and then we'll go back to our, our list and, and go through some of those terms. Uh, the biggest irony in this poem is that he says he's gonna make her famous by writing her name in the poem, but of course, her name's not in the poem. Um, it's part of a sonnet sequence that we know who it was addressed to. So I guess on some level of nuance, her name is sort of in the sequence. It's just not in this poem in which he's claiming that he's going to make her famous by writing her name in a poem as opposed to in the sand. And that's, that's a little bit ironic and maybe it undermines the text of the poem a little bit. Uh, anyway, so let's go back to our Renaissance terms and try and hit some of these things. Uh, so that, that we can make sure that we've done everything we need to do with this, this poem. So uh, we've looked at figurative language. We can sort, sort of see the simile that she uses. We've looked at the symbols, um, you know, this, this sort of a metaphorical way of making yourself immortal by writing your name in, in a poem. Clearly, they're not immortal. They both died. But some part of them, some moment of their lives lives on. So figurative language and symbolism, very, very uh, effective in this. Um, we didn't check the iambic pentameter. You want to check the iambic pentameter real quick? Um, one day I wrote her name upon the strand, 10. 
but came the waves and washed it away. Uh, 10. Again, I wrote it with a second hand. 10. Right, so we've got iambic pentameter. Um, it's got that rhythm to it. It's got 10 syllables. That's easy. Um, we looked at the end rhymes. That's that's pretty straightforward. Uh, we've looked at the rhyme schemes. Uh, three cup, sorry, three quatrains and a couplet with the interlocking rhyme that uh, Spencer has. The second rhyme of the first couplet is the first rhyme of the second couplet. The second rhyme of the second couplet is the first rhyme of the third couplet, and so on and so forth down the line, um, which makes it a Spencerian sonnet that you can see here. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and clearly it's got an unrequited love theme. Oh, we, we skipped sound devices entirely. So let's just take a quick second and appreciate alliteration, consonance, and assonance uh, before I close down this video. Uh, Spencer as, continues to improve as a poet. Can you see how much more intense and complicated this poem is? That last one was sort of frivolous and fun, um, you know, and, and about this situation about love not following the rule of nature. But this one is about human existence and the struggle we all have with our own mortality. It's so much more, I don't know, nuanced. Uh, and it uses symbols that are not as obvious. The symbols in the last one were fire and ice for different types of emotion. And that's clearly symbolism. But this idea that the name in the sand is, is a human existence in the sands of time and that the ocean's eternity and it's coming to wash us away. I'm getting existential dread just thinking about it. Um, but Sound devices. He hasn't given up on sound devices either. One day I wrote her name upon the strand, but came the waves and washed it away. We got waves washed away. Um, that's very clearly, you know, alliteration. You got and and washed, both ending with a D sound. Uh, so there's consonants there. Again, I wrote it with a second hand, wrote and with our alliteration, second hand, both end with a D. Not only do we have alliteration and consonants in both these lines, but the alliteration and consonants is in the same uh, consonant sounds and in the same order. So there's sort of a repetition of the consonants and assonants in these two lines, maybe um, suggestive of waves themselves, waves and washed. I mean, you can almost hear it. Uh, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. Um, this one, we've got tide, ends of the D sound, and ends of the D sound, made, ends of the D sound, Okay, we've got pains and prey, both start with P. We've got made and my, both start with M. Uh, so clearly we've got, um, you know, alliteration and consonants going on there as well. Vain man, said she, said she, SS, that does in vain essay um, a mortal thing so to immortalize. Uh, for I myself shall like I, Ike. We got um, some assonance going on there. Immortal eyes, that's got the eye sound in there as well. Um, shall like to this decay, uh, and eke my name be wiped out likewise. Um, you know what, I can keep going through this. Die and dust is clearly an alliteration, a pretty strong one. Um, things devise is consonants. Uh, I, can, I can keep going. Verse, virtues. Um, Verse also ends in S, and Virtues ends in S. Uh, your and Rare both end in R. Um, he's taken his time to make this really uh, easy to remember, easy to say, uh, enjoyable to listen to. And yet he's told us this really, really strong message, and he's done it all in 14 lines with five rhymes. Uh, and it fits all the rules of a sonnet while also being about something that sonnets aren't traditionally about the existential dread and the fear of the inevitability of our own death, the struggle of a human being uh, to deal with our own mortality. Uh, you know, these things are, are real meaningful struggles. All right, I'm going to shut up. I'm just going to read it to you one more time. No analysis, nothing, just so you can hear it again. Remember, my theory is that you can't appreciate a poem hearing it once. You've got to hear it multiple times to appreciate it. Uh, and this is one of those ones that's grown with me over the years, maybe because now I'm 43 and I'm, I'm closer to... Uh, that, that tombstone down the line than I than I ever was before. Um, but anyway, let, let me read it to you um, one last time. One day I wrote her name upon the strand, but came the waves and washed it away. Again, I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. 
vain man, said she, that does in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize, for I myself shall like this decay, and eke my name be wiped out likewise. Not so, quote I, let baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. My verse, your virtues rare, shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name, where when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live, and later life renew. All right, I'm calling it done. Thank you for your time and attention, folks.